Welcome everyone, Think Tech Hawaii, time for responsible change. And we're here to celebrate Juneteenth. Just signed into law by President Biden, with also proclamations from Governor Ige and from City and County of Honolulu and Mayor Blangieri. And we have with us today a just a wonderful, diverse group of people. We have retired Judge Sandra Sims from Hawaii, who survived a number of years of law practice and state court. And we can see how incredibly intact and lovely she has emerged from all of that. That makes one of us. <laughs> we have Louise Ng, one of our leading women's rights lawyers and civil litigators, a partner at Denton's. We have David Larson from the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law in St. Paul. David is, among many other things, as well as a law professor, the incoming chair of the American Bar Association section of dispute resolution, and brings to it a wonderful expertise in both conflict resolution and technology in having engineered New York's online court dispute resolution system for a number of years and Tina Patterson, mediator, arbitrator. So folks, Juneteenth, cause for celebration. Now that it's nationally recognized, where did it come from? Tina? Oh, Chuck, I'm gonna be your outlier. So the history of Juneteenth goes back to um, Lincoln signing the Emancipation Proclamation and soldiers entering Texas. There were a number of states that post um, Emancipation Proclamation that were unwilling to give up their enslaved people. And Texas was one of the last. So Juneteenth is a celebration regarding those individuals being informed that they had been emancipated by the President of the United States. Having said that, um, Juneteenth is not my thing. And I, I'm glad to see that the president has made it a national holiday. But I, I'll, I'll be transparent. I've been saying this since I was 13 years old. I wrote an essay about this. The day that I look toward is June, July 2nd, the signing of the Civil Rights Act. To me, that is my true emancipation day. No tolls, no polls, no tests at the voting. <laughs> We are talking about Juneteenth, and I think it's wonderful, but we have we have a struggle on our hands right now. Yeah. We've got educational institutions saying that they can't be being told they can't talk about critical race theory. We have people who literally are fighting for their voting rights. Um, I can appreciate the holiday, and for those who want to celebrate, I'm all for it. I think there's another element that I think will need to be explored more, which is Will it be much like Dr. King's holiday? It's a federal holiday, but private sector can make it an optional holiday. Are we going to see the same thing with Juneteenth? So I'm probably not the best person to start off this discussion <laughs> because I think others will be much more excited. But for me, um, I, I've struggled with this yeah. um, Juneteenth. And I, you know, for those who celebrate, I encourage them to do so. For me, it, it brings up the discussion of what happened after Juneteenth and the reconstruction period yes. in the United States. So, um, you know, I hate to sound like negative Nancy and for anybody named Nancy, no disrespect, um, but it, it, it just brings up, I, I'd rather see the focus on July 2nd personally, mm -hmm. but it, you know, what's done is done and we move forward. A friend texted me this afternoon and said, I've got Friday off now. This was a complete surprise. It will be interesting to see what the United States does in terms of an actual celebration and talking about the truth of what happened. And that's a fantastic place to start. Yes, it is. Because if anyone thought for a second that we are in a place in terms of racial disparities and treatment that is cause for celebration, they must be in some other country, yes. not this one. Yes. <laughs> In, in 2020, there were 40 bills introduced in right-wing legislatures to restrict voting access. In less than half of 2021, 
there are 389 in 48 different states. Thankfully, Hawaii is not one of them. But this is not a time for celebration of racial equity or equity in any of the other yeah. categories. Yeah. The Supreme Court just today issued a decision 9-0. They tried to narrow it, but basically they said to Catholic Social Services, it's okay for you to refuse foster placement with same-sex parents. We are a long way from where we need to be. Your point, Tina, is absolutely well taken. I, I saw it more of a, an opportunity for educating people as to why we are in the situation that we are in. The notion of Juneteenth is, if, if you look at what really happened, we're talking about uh, Texas, again, Texas, uh, simply refusing to allow the 250,000 enslaved people to be informed of their freedom and kept them enslaved years after the Emancipation Proclamation had been signed, kept them enslaved, continued to build their wealth based on the backs of these folks, of, of our basically my ancestors. And so what I see it as, and I, I, I'm glad you brought that perspective up, Tina, because I've always wrestled with the notion of celebrating, not even celebrating July 4th, and I have a whole story about celebrating July 4th, but um, is an option to really now look at this juxtaposition of racial equity and looking at these laws against what actually happened with Juneteenth. It was just a blatant exercise of, of racism pure and simple to simply tell these to not tell folks and they toiled and toiled and continue to toil um not knowing now i never heard i didn't know about juneteenth juneteenth until actually i moved here to hawaii and it was like in the 80s late 80s when there was one um i don't know if you remember her mary wagner she was real active with the democratic party at that time she moved to maui and she since moved to the mainland but she brought the notion of Juneteenth and I, she had this picnic to explain to people what this was all about. I, I was embarrassed at how little I knew about it. I grew up in, in Chicago and in the North and that's just not something that, well, our education system is, is, is its own issue. But when I learned of it, I mean, I've, we shared it with my kids, with the family. So we've always known about it from that time. But the, the, the thing that was shocking was that here it was, these people were just simply not told. They were free and they toiled as slaves for an additional two and a half years. Hey, and we have a question from a viewer, which is, can children who haven't been educated about critical race theory still appreciate these values and these disparities? What needs to happen in education? Critical race theory. Are we teaching kids critical race theory or are we just simply teaching them history? And if we just simply teach, teach them history, we don't have to get into the notion of critical race theory. You recognize Juneteenth standing on its own. It's like, hey, we didn't tell the people. What does that mean? What were we trying to do? I mean, critical race theory, I don't know if that's something you take in elementary school. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a subject for, I, I don't even, I don't even want to get into a debate about critical race theory because that's, let's just teach the history. Let's just tell the truth. <laughs> and the and truth that you just said is that even two and a half years after yeah. the Emancipation Proclamation, it took military intervention yes. to theoretically liberate 250,000 enslaved Black people. And who knows how long it really took after that. Exactly. For any of those people. Exactly. to obtain anything approaching freedom. So, oh, go ahead. I, I'm just, I just wanted to answer the viewer's question since I'm the one that brought up critical race theory. The critical race theory debate is actually taking place in higher, ed, higher yeah. education institutions. It's happening in colleges and universities. It's not happening in elementary schools, junior high schools, and high schools. At that level, as the viewer asked, children need to know what actually happened. We have school systems that don't want to talk about slavery. And it's removed from the books or talked about, there were people, and I used to live in Texas, so I remember this debate regarding, should we talk about 
enslaved persons. And at one point the conversation was, no, let, let, the, let the history books show in the, in the schools that these were people who enjoyed working hard and, and, and earning a living. Well, fact of the matter was they weren't working and earning a living. It was, they were enslaved, they were chattel. Um, the same, we've had conversations about talking about the internment of people in the United States yeah. and, and talking about the Trail of Tears and all, you know, First Nation people gladly moved to the West. No, that's not actually what happened. So we have to really talk about what happened, even going as far back as when the first individuals came to Jamestown, when they showed up at Plymouth Rock and what happened to the people who were there after the first year. Um, no, it's not pretty, but I think it's, it's a reality of what, what we see later with Andrew Jackson and Manifest Destiny, that this has been a thought process that goes back to 1619. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll be quiet. I know that Louise and David hadn't had, had an opportunity to speak, but I hope I answered the viewer's question because I brought up critical race theory. No, but that's important too, because as someone said about the subject of taking children away from their families, dividing families at the Southern border, don't be surprised. This is not new. This is, this is new. part of our history. We've done you know, it. We before. have done it to blacks. We have done it to indigenous people for hundreds of years. So the question is, where do we go from here? What what do we need to understand and what do we need to do about it? Oh, I, I was just thinking that, um, I mean, it's great that Hawaii and the US have recognized this as an official holiday. Um, and our, our firm had already done that. But I see this really as an opportunity. It's not really just a holiday. I mean, it's really an opportunity to learn and educate and to connect all those dots that you've been talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, you know, I wanted to let people speak, but then of course, your ideas get articulated. It's like, oh, well, you know, I'll call late, uh, later on. Um, but I think there is some value in making a national holiday because, um, now people are going to ask about it and children are going to ask about it it's like yes. what is this thing and uh i was talking with a, with a black friend of mine in new york today who oh. immigrated um uh didn't come from africa her family um but uh you know she's saying i didn't get any of this stuff in school and uh it's all you know it was all new to me uh and, and the idea that the fact that it's now a national holiday means there will be questions asked about it. And the hope is that more information will be learned. Now, I, I'm thinking about this year. I'm thinking about, you know, the information and reporting about the Tulsa Massacre, which was never talked about in school never. or anywhere. Never. And you know, finally, it's getting talked about this year. And you know, I, I feel that, that, that there is at least a... a Kind of a recognition that we need to look back and think a little harder about where we came from and what happened previously i was thinking for example i've been thinking today a lot about the idea of white privilege and i don't love that term because i think that term angers some people they resent it they don't respond to it i don't even think it's accurate i mean i think there is white privilege but really, I think a better term is, is, is white indebtedness. I mean, there's really, there's really a debt. Um, when we talk about slavery and the history of slavery and the fact that wealth was built upon a, a population that didn't participate in that wealth building. And there's a, you know, so it's privilege, I don't think is the right word. I think indebtedness is a better word. And, and I don't know if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> I just thought about this today. But, you know, but the fact that it's, we've got this holiday has me thinking about it. It's got to have other people thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's positive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree think, with you, David. I think it is David, positive. you've raised a really important point, which is children may come, young people may come to see things without some of the lenses, without some of the biases. If the learning is opened up, and if it's okay to talk about it, it's okay. To, 
what Sandra mentioned before, what Tina mentioned before, there is a concerted effort to prevent that kind of learning from opening. Hey, and all of you folks are or have been involved in education personally, through your children, through your families. What needs to happen in our learning system different from what has been happening? I think we need to just simply tell the truth. Tell the truth. Um, you know, slavery wasn't, in order to perpetuate slavery, we had to tell, we had to diminish the humanity of, of Blacks who were born from Africa. We had to decide and, 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 and document that they were not people so we could justify it. Tell I think truth. also, Oh, sorry, Sandra. No, go ahead. You, you... Oh, my thinking on how do we teach history differently is I would just remember the way I was taught it, which was really from the dominant um, colonizing um, population's perspective. And um, so I identify too with our founding fathers and that history. But I think what's important is that all, even more and more, we need to learn it from the perspective of all the different groups that have enriched our history and our culture. Um, that's starting. I think that in some many ways, this, uh, you know, we have an, everybody calls it an inflection point. We have a point, maybe because of the pandemic, where people are much more aware of these issues. This is a point at which we can um, hopefully treat ethnic studies as just not ethnic studies, but really it's part of the fabric of um, our history. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. That's absolutely it. It shouldn't just be marginalized as to some you know, ancillary of, of the history. It's a part of how we became who I mean, we look at, I mean, when you look at things like the arts and, and the creativity of people who came out of those systems and what they had to do to spiritually strengthen themselves to endure, it's not just, you know, in Africa, for African-Americans, for Native Hawaiians. I mean, you took the whole, you had to build that whole thing of your sense of who you are based on your language, your culture that you struggle to preserve in some places, the instance and struggle to define and find it, and then be able to build that, um, to build that up. And that's, and we made that part of American culture, but we got to understand the pain that that culture came out of to be as important as it is. You know, I, I think you need to be, you know, as an educator, I think we need to be proactive. Mm -hmm. So at my law school, Mitchell Hamlin School of Law, we we are we've changed our mission statement, and we're going to identify our, ourselves as an unbiased anti-racist school. Mm -hmm. So that you know that's fine, Excellent. that's great. So so, but okay. what does that mean? It's got to mean something. It's got to it's got to it's got to result in some kind of action. And we're spending a lot of time talking about okay, what does that mean? And what does it mean to be anti-racist? Does it mean just not to be overtly racist? That can't be it. It's got to be something more active than that. So then the question becomes, okay, what kinds of actions should we be engaging in and what kinds of actions are necessary? I think that's, that's really productive and that's mm -hmm. part of my responsibility as an educator to think about where are we today and what can I do as an educator to make things better? And that may require some some action, some act, some activist. And, and all of you have touched deeply upon a critical convergence of what Sandra, David, the two of you put so well. It's a cultural indebtedness. There is a cultural debt that is owed to people who have been undervalued, dishonored, disserve. There are cultural reparations as well as others that need to be sincerely understood and undertaken. Yeah, and, that, uh, and that's kind of why I was thinking about that term indebtedness today. Because when people talk about privilege, it just doesn't connect with reparations. It's just like, I don't see the connection. Debt is connected to reparations, um, and that's why I think that's a that's a better term. And if you understand how the founding fathers 
became so wealthy at relatively young ages in life, it's because they had slaves. And, um, you know, so wealth was built upon people's shoulders who didn't participate in the accumulation of that wealth. And, um, you know, I think that, that if we frame it that way, I think it's much more understandable. We see that in, we see that in, in Hawaii, in you know, in, in Native Native Amer Native Hawaiian history, is that the whole concept of of overthrowing the, the the kingdom had to be crushed and made to look like something else that was necessary. And then, in the course of doing that, you really you've crushed a people, you've crushed a you've crushed a society, or at least certainly attempted. And for those that have you know fought to to bring it back. And I think Ray Dean's been on a few times to talk about, you know, some of the um, instances that, that, you know, were a part of her study. And, and then you look at like now, I think you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, Davis, we got to, you know, look internally and see what it is that we need to, to look at and decide what needs to be told and how it needs to be shared. That story needs to be told. I mean, when I teach my classes in criminal justice about the Massey case here in Hawaii, students who are young, they're 18, 19, 20-year-old students, they are simply appalled. They had no, they have no, that's not taught to them. The notion that, you know, someone who's Native Hawaiian would just be hauled away and, and, and killed and there'd be no consequence. And it's, you know, those kinds of things have shaped um, how, as, as Louise has pointed out, how we have that colonial perspective even here that still lingers. It's why you have so many more, you know, Native 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 Hawaiians and 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 people of color incarcerated in our the the incarceration rates are so high for those groups. Um, that's that's a piece of it. I was talking about thing. Yeah, you know, that you, it's one thing to say you're anti-racist, and then what are you going to do about it? One thing our school is doing about it, we have a, a truth and action project. Mm -hmm. And you know, the premise is that you can't really have any reform without understanding the truth. You can't have any mm -hmm. reconciliation reform unless you understand the truth first. So uh, the first phase of the project is to go out in the community and basically collect stories of people who believe they've, and in particular it's focusing on the criminal justice system. Who, who have been victims of systemic bias in the criminal justice system. We begin to collect those stories. And there's a large advisory group that's very cross-occupational, prosecutors, defenders, judges, um, you know, trying to get as wide a breadth as possible of people participating in this project. But the goal is to try and accumulate these stories and identify common themes and begin to quantify things in terms of uh, you know, is a particular kind of thing happening in a particular step in the process and plea bargaining and you know, it, it, you know, parole hearings at different points. Can we actually identify problem points in this process empirically so it's not just anecdotal and then maybe we can begin to, begin to create some reform. David, is that happening in other law schools too? I know that various professors have looked at aspects of truth and reconciliation and reparations, but um, you know how widespread is it in the legal? You know, I, I think I think we're at a you know at the emerging stage where people are beginning to do that kind of thing. Um, I, you know, I think there's probably been isolated cases where people have actually tried to do that, but I think it's been pretty isolated in terms mm -hmm. of a particular study in a particular jurisdiction wrote an article about it and maybe that's where it ended um you know and I, the hope is that you know hope with our project is that okay we'll start in the in kind of the st paul minneapolis let's build it out into the sur surrounding metro area and then let's take it out to the whole entire state and keep expand keep just keep expanding it now tina forwarded an information i was just curious i mean it kind of ties in with something i think it was tina who forwarded about some well providence rhode island maybe there's other uh, cities too mm -hmm. that are starting their own truth and reconciliation reparation mm -hmm. effort. you know is that a, a one-off or are you seeing that in other municipalities too 
I am seeing it in, in other municipalities. Um, a friend of mine, a childhood friend, actually, um, her mother is a, a descendant of a First Nation um, community in Rhode Island and a Truth and Reconciliation, um, oh, what would I call it? It's beyond a committee, but they formed so that they could talk about the truth of of what it was like for, in this case, we're, we're talking about the first settlers, English settlers, white settlers coming to Rhode Island and what the, what the interface was with the peoples on those lands that initially, um, there's been a lot of misinformation, a lot of things that have been left out and we're starting to see this elsewhere. I know I, in the, Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, there's more conversation. Whose land are you on? Um, I'm mm -hmm. currently participating in a mm -hmm. project where about um, facilitating racially just spaces. And each session, we have to start by talking about whose land are we on? And I oh. know I'm currently on the land of the Piscataway and Amanahoac. Okay. Um, but it's enlightening because you can literally see, um, as you mentioned mm -hmm. before, Louise, in this mosaic. Um, I think about the area in Louisiana where I was born. And I always knew that my great grandmother was uh, um, one of her descendants is, is First Nation, but I never knew. And when I typed in the area where I was born, it suddenly popped up and I thought, well, that makes sense. It's Choctaw, um, wow. but I, 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 I never knew it, but it makes, when I go back and look at the records and I see the naming conventions and see some of the pictures, it, it definitely ties in. So yes, we're, I think we're starting to see more of this where, right where it's the opportunity to talk about where is, like you said, Louise, that inflection point, but you know, you have parallel, parallel activity happening. So um, I, it also makes me think about the stories that we hear in the South where you have outlier communities um, of Chinese in the yeah. South and people will ask, well, how did that happen? I thought the Chinese were only on the West Coast. No man, <laughs> uh, right. you know, and, and mm -hmm. again, it's that parallel that mosaic, the same thing in, in Minnesota, when we talk about First Nation people, the people who came from Scandinavian nations, but also those who were traveling from the East heading West and that influx in terms of ideology, culture, food, way of life, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a mosaic. Excellent, yeah. And while we're out of time for today, maybe that's a good place for us to stop with that thought that maybe starting with Juneteenth, we've moved toward some concept of restorative truth that is part of a cultural debt to those who have been deprived of it and, and a cultural obligation of those who have misused it or abused it for advantage. Maybe truth that seeks balance is where we might need to go. Thank you all. Come back and join us in two weeks. Thanks for coming to Think Tech Hawaii. And thanks, David, Sandra, Tana, Louise. Wonderful insights and input. Whose land are you on? I like that. That's a good place to start a discussion. Whose land? And I think that applies to all of us uh, in all of the places that we are, certainly Hawaii and Minnesota and the East Coast and everywhere. I like it. Thank you.